Um, I'm Giovanni Noguera from the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. It is March 20th, 2012, and I'm interviewing Mr. Harvey Ward at the Holy Trinity Epi Episcopal. Episcopal. Episcopal, sorry. You don't touch with me. Church in Gainesville, Florida. Um, I guess first question is, where are you from and when were you born? I was born in uh, 1967. I'm from here in Gainesville. Mm -hmm. And... I guess I'm, who, who are your parents? Uh, I'm actually a junior. I'm Harvey Ward Jr. My dad is Harvey Ward. My wife and my mother is Julia Ward. Mm-hmm. And I guess, I guess the first question would be, what brought you and your wife to Holy Trinity? Well, yeah. I, I, <laughs> actually, I, I came to the Holy Trinity um, uh, a little over 10 years ago. Um, I had always uh, driven by Holy Trinity and um, knew knew about the church and, and had a, a good um, understanding of the church and was looking for a church home at the time and visited and really uh, enjoyed it. First time I was here and I was single at the time and um, when I started dating my uh, my future wife, we I, I brought her here and we were married here and all our children were baptized here. Really? So... <laughs> Um, and your wife's name is? Jillian. Jillian? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's up. Um, if you, if you could, if you could, um, could you also spell your name for the, for listeners? Sure. H-A-R-V-E-Y W-A-R-D. Mm -hmm. Junior. All right. All right. Next question. Mm -hmm. Um, what, a, what, what, you got, what appeal to you about the church specifically? And specifically, it, um, I, <laughs> I, I grew up in, in the Lutheran church. And was was confirmed Lutheran, um, and had experience with other mainline denominations, so I, I had a pretty good idea of what the Episcopal Church was about, but had drifted away from going to church at all uh, <laughs> and, until my, my early thirties, and uh, did a lot of research um, with the, the national churches to find out what the um, some general opinions of the national churches were and how they uh, where they came down on uh, some specific issues and. Um, theologically and politically and in a variety of ways. And Holy Trinity was one of the churches, uh, the Episcopal Church in general was one of the churches that I found was probably more in line with where I was theologically. And I decided that I wanted to come visit and see what it was about. And it was good enough I never visited anywhere else. So. I guess, um, how does the, has the church sort of enhanced your life or influenced it in any manner? Absolutely, yes. yes. Um, it's, um, again, I, when I started coming here, I was mm -hmm. looking for a church in particular because I hadn't been part of a church home in, in 10 or 15 years at that point and wanted uh, a, an institutional spiritual aspect back in my life. And there was lots of opportunity here to either just sit in the services and it was big enough that I could just sit in the back and, and slowly become comfortable with it or I could jump right in and get involved in things. And there were lots of great things going on at the time, including um, one of the first things that came to uh, outside Sunday morning was, uh, and this is a, a good time to remember it, was a, uh, an anti-Iraq war protest. It was a candlelight vigil uh, the first night of, of the war. Um, and that was one of the first things I participated in here that was not a, a Sunday morning sort of thing. So there was a, a, a good church family here to be a part of. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew a number of people who were already parishioners here who I worked with in uh, various boards and things around town. So it was, I knew a lot of the people here, but it was a, a really good fit. And I've... <laughs> Uh, I guess, if you, do you have any children? Yes, we have uh, three uh, three daughters. Three daughters? They, they were all baptized here. Our, our oldest um, just turned eight, and this mm -hmm. past Sunday she had her solemn communion ceremony here. So. Really? Congrats. Um, Thank you. Thank you. What's your call? Um, are your children also involved in the church? Or? Yes. Um, they're all, they're all, I mean, our, our youngest is 21 months, so she... <laughs> is here, but not particularly involved. Can't really do much. Uh, but the uh, the eight year old and five year old um, are involved in Sunday school and um, and the other things that that the church offers. Uh, we have a um, a Girl Scout troop that meets here, and my oldest is uh, part of that Girl Scout troop. And so yeah, they're they're all involved. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me see. And about I, I'm starting to use the town myself. So uh, about how involved is the church with the town of Gainesville in general? Just uh, 
Uh, our church takes our, our position here geographically in downtown Gainesville very seriously. Um, we uh, have one of our, our larger ministries is uh, outreach to the uh, the homeless in Hungary, which is a, you know obviously a serious problem in downtown Gainesville. Um, we have a Sunday morning, <coughs> excuse me, a Sunday morning um, street side breakfast mm-hmm. uh, where we invite folks in who wouldn't otherwise have a hot meal to come in and, and, and do that. And that gets anywhere from a, you know, 30 to 50 people a, a Sunday. Mm-hmm. Um, we're involved in, uh, um, in faith hospitality ministries, um, which um, brings folks into who are families who are homeless, kind of in between opportunities and gives them a place to sleep. And we're, we do that a week at a time. And then they go to other churches when weeks that we're not hosting. Mm-hmm. Um, we um, we're involved politically is the wrong way to say it, but we're we're involved civically. Uh, every other year we host a um, a blessing for uh, elected officials and um, and judicial uh, employees mm-hmm. um, in uh, October every other year, and that's always very well attended. Um, in two thousand ten, when there was uh, a to give some context to the whole thing, there was uh, a, a minister over uh, in Northwest Gainesville who was mm-hmm. threatening to burn the Quran and got national attention because of it and all this. Holy yeah. Trinity hosted an interfaith service that was just, just wonderful. We, we could not have put another person in, in the church that day. It was the middle of the week. I think it was a Wednesday at, uh, at noon. And we had, because the folks were, were covering this person uh, across town, there were CNN trucks here. We had cameras from CBS, from NBC affiliates, from all over the world. We had a reporter here from from a French newspaper, even. Really. Um, and the whole point of it was to to bring the interfaith community together and say, hate is not what what the faith community is about. Mm-hmm. We are stronger than that. We embrace people from from all faiths. Mm-hmm. And, and, and again, it was just a, a wonderful event, something I'll, I'll always remember. But we were mm-hmm. very involved in that. We were uh, among the uh, the congregations who came up with the idea, and we ended up hosting it. And it's just a, a wonderful event. I think I've heard that event specifically. I do remember a few years ago there were a few, like a mass Quran burnings happening. Right, right. And and this this event was, was in... Around that. The, in in response to mm-hmm. that, essentially. And again, we, we had uh, coverage on CNN, um, and it was... Uh, mm-hmm. A very well covered event, but it was also just just a wonderful thing to, to be a part of. Mm-hmm. Is that too much to ask? Um, can I ask um, where you were educated? Like, sure. Yeah, um, I went to public schools here in Gainesville. Actually, I went to private Catholic school, uh, an elementary school, but I went to Eastside High mm-hmm. and uh, Santa Fe Community College. Then it was Santa Fe Community College mm-hmm. and uh, UF. Mm-hmm. And what did you major in? Public relations. Public relations. I thought you think of that. <laughs> Um, also, you brought up uh, you brought up interfaith or, like interfaith relationships. Um, mm-hmm. Do what other religious faiths are you involved with here in this in the Gainesville community? If I may ask, uh, Holy Trinity is uh, very active with uh, well First Methodist Church mm-hmm. downtown, or you know, just a couple blocks from us here. Um, so we, we do a lot of, of work with them, and there's a long history with that. When uh, when our church burned down in 1991, mm-hmm. um, Holy Trinity met at um, um, at First Methodist for a number of years, and we try to commemorate that on a regular basis and, and mm-hmm. have a good relationship with with First Methodist. Um, but our 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 rector, our chief priest, does um, meets regularly with other faith leaders around town, with um, the rabbi of in Israel, um, all the other Episcopal uh, priests in town, of course, have a, a good network. Mm-hmm. Um, she works with Dan Johnson out at uh, uh, Trinity Methodist and, and a number of other churches. Um, uh, when Larry Reimer was still at uh, United Church of Gainesville, there was a great relationship there. And I'm sure that there will be again when they uh, get their new uh, folks um, fully enshrined in, in, their, uh, in that church. Um, we've worked some with uh, Father Julian over at St. Patrick's. Uh, just a, a very good relationship with... Most of the faith community in Gainesville, <laughs> very much a, an interfaith group here in town. That's so. good to know. Um, I guess. Well, if we can get, I guess I can move on now. Um, can you explain your role within the church, within this foundation? Sure. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Holy Trinity Foundation. 
the Holy Trinity Foundation has been around since the late 60s as a financial support for the church. Um, all churches and most nonprofits go through ups and downs and in funding. And the hope is that with this foundation as a, kind of a financial backstop, that we can even out those those issues and never go through boom and bust cycles um, with um, uh, with the church budget. Um, every now and then we're able to do more extraordinary things with the foundation, but primarily that's that's what it's there for to provide a an evening influence and a financial backstop for the parish. Um, as the executive director there, um, I do a lot of uh, the fundraising uh, work for the church, which we call stewardship and church work. Um, not only from a, a major gifts standpoint and a capital campaign standpoint, which we just finished, but also through the annual stewardship work. And I do other things that, that come up from time to time that the church needs help with because my office is here in the church mm -hmm. um, and I'm a church member. So there are often opportunities for me to be involved in other things like the, uh, the interfaith service that we did. Um, I was able to put some of my time in and doing public relations work for that and media relations work to, to help that go off smoothly. <laughs> so mostly it's uh, administrating the foundation and doing fundraising, but there are other opportunities to do things from time to time. And um, how did you come to work here? Like, did you have a job beforehand or? I used to work at, um, for eight years, I was uh, a fundraiser for WUFT on, uh, on UF campus, the uh, uh, PBS and NPR local stations. Mm -hmm. I did uh, membership fundraising there and corporate fundraising there. And they went through some changes, and I thought that I might be more comfortable somewhere else mm -hmm. um, back in 2009. And um, again, had a good working relationship with uh, the rector here, as well as um, uh, several folks uh, in, who had something to do with the, the Holy Trinity Foundation. And we came up with the idea that the foundation really kind of needed an executive director if we were going to take a, a next step, and we needed uh, professional uh, management. So we created the position, and that's where I've been doing since. <laughs> um, well, for one thing, um, can you give us a context of what the capital campaign was? Or is sure. Um, for a number of years, uh, capital campaigns in many nonprofits and churches, uh, usually you, you try to have a capital campaign every, maybe every seven years or so, maybe ten years. <laughs> It had been about 20 years since we had one here, and that was really too long. We had a number of, of big projects that people had talked about for, for many years that just aren't the sort of things you can handle out of a normal annual budget. And as those things kind of um, percolated over the years, it became obvious we needed to do some things, such as, um, to backtrack a minute, we, we've had a preschool here in, um, uh, in the church for probably 30 years. The idea was that that could really excel if it had a little more space to grow. And the foundation had acquired a few years ago a uh, building down the street that we decided, you know, if we were able to raise enough money, we could turn that building around into a really first class uh, day school operation. And that was one of the driving influences behind the capital campaign. Um, and we raised a very significant um, uh, money to do that with. Um, our parishioners were, were very generous um, and between that and several other projects we, uh, we've we raised enough money to uh, to do a lot of major work to the church and to the, the school and to, to make a lot of, of really great things happen, we believe. Um, what do you want to name any other notable programs? Sure, we, uh, we're going to, you mean within the capital campaign? Yes. Right. We're, we hope to um, <laughs> Uh, for instance, uh, we have a large pipe organ here in mm -hmm. the church, and I didn't know this until a few years ago when we started talking about the capital campaign. There are a lot of things you can do with pipe organs. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's not as if you just come in and put the instrument, install the instrument, and it's that's how it is for the next fifty years. Mm -hmm. There are always things you can add on to it, apparently, to make it easier to play. Apparently, this is a very difficult instrument to play. And there's some things you can do to make it less strenuous on the, uh, the person playing it. Uh, you can add other sounds to it and that sort of thing. So that's one of the areas that we raised money for. Um, we installed a, a new heating and air conditioning system on the campus of the church here. 
with the understanding that that would be paid for uh, through the capital campaign, and it was, and that was um, a very expensive endeavor, and it's it was necessary. We had the the system that was here had been here since the church was rebuilt, and it was time for for a new system. But those are excessive ex expenditures, and we needed something extraordinary like a capital campaign to pay for that. Same thing with the sound system. We had installed a new sound system not long ago to. Um, uh, because when the church was built, it, it's a wonderful room, but it really had some, some downfalls in spoken word, the way the, uh, the sound system was installed. We installed a new system that makes it much, much better. Um, everyone who is hooked into the, to the sound system who has a microphone on can be heard throughout the room now, and it's, it's a very clear, um, usable system. Again, that was expensive and needed to be paid for out of, out of the capital campaign. Um, we have a, the foundation owns a building on the corner of uh, Northeast 2nd Avenue, or excuse me, yeah, Northeast 2nd Avenue and, and North Main that has been used for a variety of purposes by the church. Some of the ministries within the church had a, a, some other ideas to, to use that building for, and we're, we're raising money to, to uh, make that building usable for those. We had to put a new roof on the building and, and, and that sort of thing. That um, We had a total of... I think seven projects that, that were funded through the campaign and there are still funds coming in for the campaign. So there may be other projects that are funded going forward. And through what means does the campaign necessarily raise funds? If I may ask, I'm not sure I, through which means, sorry, like, uh, we went directly to the parishioners. Oh, um, we oh. talked to the congregation and said, we, these are, these are the, the projects that we could possibly do if, you know, with, with your help and, uh, and parishioners responded very, very well, and we, um, we've we had um, uh, about 200 parishioners um, are, are, are supporting financially in everything from, uh, from three-figure gifts to six-figure gifts, seven-figure gifts in, in, in one case. So, uh, so it's been very successful and, and uh, a fantastic experience to be a part of. I'm glad it's over. Mostly over. We're still getting a few gifts in, but um, the major fundraising is, is winding down, and it, it was an exhausting time, but it was very, very, very worth it. Yeah. Um, um, what do you and the church and the foundation see as its mission in Gainesville? Like, well, I, I, I wouldn't want to speak for for, for the for, for the whole church um, or for the foundation. I'm an employee of the foundation, mm -hmm. and we have a, a board who directs the the ultimate vision. My vision for the foundation, and I think that of of the trustees primarily, is to support the church in whatever the church feels it needs to do, whatever the parish and the, the parishioners feel the direction they need to go in. The foundation's responsibility is to uh, to make sure that that we're there. Mm -hmm. to uh, to support that and and to shepherd the uh, the assets that have been given to us over the years mm -hmm. wisely and make sure that that those assets continue to be there for for many years um, personally my my vision as mm -hmm. a parishioner for for this church is to uh, to serve the needs of not only those who come and worship in our pews but to reach out and take care of the least among us as uh, as Jesus asked us to do. Um, another question is how is the how is holy how are you so how are you and the church also what do we call it, I guess combating these means of you know hunger from the community from well again we have um, we have a number of different programs mm -hmm. um, Everything from the uh, downtown, what we call our downtown ministry, mm -hmm. which is a very specific ministry on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, we have volunteers come in uh, for, for 11 to, to 1 on two days a week. But there's a lot more administrative work that those volunteers do that they hear a lot more than four hours a week. Um, mm -hmm. But they're actually seeing clients about four hours a week. The clients are guests that come in as homeless and hungry folks. What we offer them during that time is um, help in getting uh, prescription medication. Uh, we offer a voucher system to do that. We offer um, help in getting uh, driver's licenses or, or state IDs, uh, help in getting um, uh, birth certificates because, and I didn't know this until uh, the folks in our ministry told me about it, but 
if you if you don't have an address, you're homeless, and you lose your state ID, you lose your birth certificate, you can't get the social services that are available. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a catch-22. You can't just, obviously, you don't have any money, so you can't go down and pay the, uh, the folks at uh, the health department to get a birth certificate replaced. And without that birth certificate, you can't go to the DMV and get an ID. And without the ID, you can't get social services. So our specific goal with that ministry is to help folks get um, those simple things that they must have in order for the social services net to, uh, to begin to take care of them. Um, that's one of the things that we do that is apparently unique. I mean, we, we worked hard to fill a niche that wasn't being met by other churches or other organizations in town. Mm -hmm. And that really seems to be a thriving ministry. <laughs> Uh, again, we have um, streetside breakfast on Sunday mornings. We have folks who come in and prepare breakfast for anyone who comes in to, to get a hot meal. Um, we're involved in uh, Interfaith Hospitality Network, as, as I talked about, which is just a wonderful ministry. We, um, uh, we have families sleeping in our classrooms and our meeting rooms and things uh, throughout the weeks that, that, that we're hosting that. And we have <clears throat> hundreds of volunteers um, over the course of the year who were involved in that ministry, everything from uh, preparing meals and uh, enjoying the meals with, with the guests who come in for that to uh, washing sheets when, when the whole thing's done with, um, you know, coming in, setting up the cots for people in the classrooms and, and all that. Just a, a huge number of people go into making that successful and to helping those people have a, a comfortable experience, comfortable experience in the, the short time that they're with us. If I may, oh, sorry, what do you think? No, go ahead. If I may ask, um, are you involved in any other organization through these programs, or is it just the church? Well, the, you mean me personally, or? The, the, the church in general, sorry. Yeah, sure, the, um, the church is active with the... Um, the Methodist uh, Church, I think you brought them up. Yes, yeah, so, but with the uh, Gainesville Community Ministries, we have a good working relationship with them, mm -hmm. with um, uh, the Coalition for the Homeless in Hungary, um, uh, we have a couple of members who are very active in that, that whole network of, of organizations, uh, including Terry Fleming, who is one of the drivers behind um, Downtown Ministry. Um, and they, they do a great job of coordinating with the other services that are available. And that's why it was so important for the Downtown Ministry to be specific in the services that Holy Trinity offers, instead of just duplicating something that other folks are doing. We wanted to do something that is a need and that isn't being met by the other organizations. And to do that, we you know, certainly had to uh, to do a great deal of coordination with the other services. You mentioned earlier you were employed in UF before. Do you still have any connections with the university? Or? My wife is uh, um, uh, chair of the um, Spanish and Portuguese Studies Department. Really? At UF. Is the church in any way involved with the university or is it all? Only such that probably on any given Sunday, 60-70% of the people in our pews have some connection with UF, just like you know anything else against what does, but but no, we don't have any specific tie to, mm -hmm. to the universe. If I may ask, I know on the phone you said you were you weren't here when the fire happened, but if you probably can you tell me anything you know about the event and the rebuilding process? Sure. Um, uh, there are a lot of folks that, that you could and should talk to because they're, you know, we have a lot of people who are still members, still very active with us, who not only were here during that process, but actually saw the church burn. Um, it was uh, Martin Luther King Day um, in 2001. I'm sorry, not 2001, but 1991. Um, and um, the... Uh, it was about nine, ten in the morning, sometime fairly early morning. Um, people reported seeing smoke rise out of the uh, out of somewhere downtown, and a lot of our members just kind of drifted downtown to to see, you know, what what was going on. Some of our members, uh, one in particular, um, worked just a few blocks down the street, a law firm, and saw the smoke and hurried down the street. He was, I believe, on the vestry at the time. Our the vestry is our our governing body of the church. Um, and rushed down the street to see what, what was going on, and I, the church was burning. Um, and of course, they called the the um, the fire department immediately, but there was really very little they could do at that point. It was a wooden structure, and went up fairly quickly. 
Um, it was a, an arsonist um, who had burned down a number of other churches um, up and down I-75, including two or three others in Gainesville. Didn't seem to be very particular about which churches. He just burned churches. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, it, it literally came down to, to almost rubble and eventually was rubble because they had to knock everything down to be able to, to rebuild. Mm -hmm. um, a, a short time after the fire, I don't know if it was the following, I think it was probably the following Sunday, um, they had uh, arranged to bring in bleachers um, and put around the, the ruins of the church and held church service right there. Um, the... Um, the Methodist Church again. All the churches in town apparently were were very quick to offer meeting space. Uh, obviously, First Methodist being just a few blocks away was the most logical choice, and they were very uh, uh, very open with their facilities. And that's where we held services for two or three years. Um, this church was um, reopened, and I want to say 1995. I may be off on that, but you know they had they had to raise quite a bit of money. Um, in a fairly short time to, to get the process moving and did a fantastic job of, of, of um, rebuilding a better facility than, than the one that had been here. Very much like what had been here, but bigger and stronger and um, more useful than, than what had been here. Um, there was a lot of discussion because the opportunity was there about whether or not it made sense to stay in downtown Gainesville, or was this the opportunity to move to the suburbs and you know try to, to follow people? Mm -hmm. um, but the church leadership at that time had a very strong commitment to being here mm -hmm. with all that that entailed, uh, knowing that if you're downtown, you're, you're going to need to offer services that you would not need to do if you're on Archer Road or if you're on 39th Avenue or somewhere. Uh, so they very specifically chose to be a part of downtown Gainesville. Mm -hmm. And um, it's no accident that we're here. And, and I think that's one of the things that drew me to this to this church was that this church is intentional about what it does and about the services that we offer to the community uh, as a whole. And that, that's very attractive to, to a lot of folks that we made that decision intentionally. And again, it's um, a, a more useful and bigger and stronger structure mm -hmm. than it was before the fire, and um, I don't think this person would mind me telling this, but uh, a friend of mine who is a parishioner tells that um, as he watched the, the fire, once he knew that nobody was hurt or anything like that, one of his first thoughts was, we needed a bigger church anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the Lord works in mysterious ways. I guess so. Uh, well, it, I, I don't know this, I don't know if I'm going a bit out of bounds here, but... No. Like I, mean, I know this church is more based on that, but how do you feel? How do you feel about the recent surge of, I guess, super super churches? So these mega churches. Yeah, these mega, these, these mega, so these for for profit ish, I guess. I, I, people can where wherever people want to find the spirit is where they should be. I see. That's not the sort of worship that we offer. Mm -hmm. um, we're a pretty traditional church. Um, we're not as, as conservative as, as some Episcopal churches. We're not as um, non-traditional as, as some. But we, we kind of strike a good middle ground, which is what the Episcopal way of life is, is mm -hmm. about, finding that, that middle way. And I think we do a good job of that. Um, we, we're not a PowerPoint church. You know, we don't have <laughs> screens that, that have uh, all the uh, every, everything on them. We expect people to follow along in an actual book. Mm -hmm. Um. And I, I'm very comfortable with us, us being mm -hmm. that. And there are mega churches that are doing wonderful work, probably, mm -hmm. that are giving people an opportunity to meet spirit where they're comfortable, mm -hmm. and that's great. There are storefront churches where people are having their spiritual needs met. And that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. My spiritual needs are best met at a church like this. More, I guess, more simplistic. Well, more, um, more traditional. Okay. Yeah. Um, you mentioned also... I think this is a bit of a retreat, but as someone, I'm a bit of an outsider to Gainesville, but how exactly how big is the homeless issue here in the community, if I may ask? Uh, for for Gainesville, we, we have, I, I can't give you exact figures, of but course. my understanding is that we have a, a bigger per capita homeless population 
than most cities our size. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that. We're, you know, Gainesville is the biggest town near the state prison. Mm -hmm. And very often people coming out of prison just gravitate toward the, the closest town. That's not to say that everybody who's homeless is, is um, okay. you know, straight out of prison. That's not the case at all. Um, you know, the climate is good. Mm -hmm. um, so Florida in general has a lot of homeless issues that other states don't necessarily have. People come here and you can live here homeless. Uh, it's mm -hmm. hot, but you can live here homeless. You can't, it's harder to live homeless in, in northern cities. Um, so we, we have a, a, a homeless population, but that really isn't our issue here. Our issue is those folks are here. The gospel tells us it's our job to serve those people. Mm -hmm. So whether, whether there's something the city could do to, to lower that population or not, maybe they can, maybe they can't, doesn't matter. They're here. It's our job to help. <laughs> there <are other> questions. <laughs> um, I guess, is there any way the church is providing a nurturing program for the members, I guess the faculty here, both people who work here and people, I guess, attend mass? I would. We don't call it mass, by the way. Oh, um, sorry. That's, that's, that's I was okay. raised Catholic. Yeah, yeah, most I, of my life, I understand. So. Uh, you would find that our services are, are very. I, I went to Catholic elementary school, so mm -hmm. I, I know what mass looks like. Um, <laughs> our services are, are very much like um, a Roman Catholic service. Um, there are a lot of differences between between our tradition and the Roman Catholic tradition, but. It's a comfortable transition for a lot of people. My wife, for instance, grew up Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. We have a number of former Roman Catholics. Um, for that matter, we have a number of, of former Baptists, too, and they kind of find a middle ground here that, that they're comfortable with. Um, I'm sorry, I, I lost track of the question there. I, I got sidetracked. I guess, I guess the question is basically, what, what does the church provide for both, I guess, the faculty and members that attend um, the church? I, I would like... Ultimately, uh, for us to provide more um, more opportunity for uh, to, to reach out to, to young faculty and mm -hmm. to uh, to grad students, I, I think that we are um, a natural for for a lot of those folks. The Episcopal Church encourages people to think mm -hmm. and to not just you know we, we, we don't present dogma and say you must believe this. We say mm -hmm. here's what we think it's probably about. Come in and let's talk about it and let's think <laughs> through this. And I think that is is attractive to, to a lot of folks um, in, in a university setting. And I would like us to do more outreach to, to be able to bring more people in. Traditionally, we have had a tremendous number of folks who have been uh, faculty at UF who, who have um, become members here. Um, very common among our, our, our membership. And I'd like to, to continue to do that um, in a more organized way instead of just hoping they show up. Being a little more intentional about that, mm -hmm. uh, and I guess the, the church. Be quick a second. I'll just edit out any long pauses. <laughs> I guess you mentioned that you were what you call it. Were you have you been religious your entire life? Or I, I was. <clears throat> I was baptized Methodist. My parents were Methodist mm -hmm. when I was very young, and we uh, started going to a Lutheran church. And I was confirmed Lutheran. Mm -hmm. At, which was a fantastic background, and at the same time, I was attending uh, St. Patrick's um, Elementary School, so mm -hmm. I was I was getting the Roman Catholic influence as well as the Methodist and Lutheran influences. And through the confirmation process in the Lutheran Church, I learned a lot about the Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther, and had a, a really good background in, in all that. And as I grew up and uh, we, we attended a Presbyterian church for a few years after that, and I kind of dr just drifted away. Mm -hmm. Always had a, a strong spiritual influence, but um, after spending most of my 20s and early 30s away from a church, I felt as though I needed a, a more institutional approach to my spirituality mm -hmm. and was, was very happy to, to get back involved. But yeah, I've, I've always been religious to some degree. Um, let me ask, um, who were your parents and the professions? Uh... Uh, Harvey Ward and Julia Ward. Uh, my mother taught school for a few years, but was primarily a homemaker. Um, my dad was uh, involved in uh, rental properties for a number of years here in town. They're Methodists right now. Both are Methodists. Mm -hmm. Do you? Well, I'm not sure. This is probably for the interview, but do you? Do you have ever had any issues or with, with your change of faith, or have they been supportive? Well, not really change of faith, but yeah. There's there's a 
there are differences between the mainline Protestant um, churches, but not very distinct ones. I mean, we, we have a different sort of worship than the Methodists do and that the Lutherans do, but it's not as different as going from from I, a, I a fundamentalist Baptist church like to this. Or not, not the same sort of thing. Really. Yeah, I mean, no. it's, it's, yeah, no. The, the, matter of fact, uh, there, there is, I forget the term for it, but um, Lutheran um, uh, ministers and Episcopal priests have some, some back and forth um, professionally that, that they um, um, can be in each other's churches and, and, and be leaders in each other's churches. So there's a lot of, of and I'm not using the right terminology at all for any of this because I, I don't know it. But um, but there's a lot of crossover between the, the mainline Protestant denominations. Mm -hmm. So Methodists and and uh, Episcopalians and Lutherans and Presbyterians. There's some daylight between us, but not a lot. <laughs> I guess. Um, I guess another question is Wesley. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Well, thanks for, <laughs> Thank for, for asking me, and I appreciate the opportunity. No problem. Thank you for taking your time to interview me. Sure.